I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Despite his denying that he even knew Jesus three times, you never hear the apostle referred to as denying Peter. You never hear confused Mary, despite Mary Magdalene not recognizing the risen Christ as he stood before her. And yet Thomas, poor Thomas, is always remembered as doubting Thomas because of that one time. That one time he simply asked to experience what all the other disciples had, ex had experienced, to see Jesus himself. It's unjust, I think, to constantly call him doubting Thomas. Because in the rest of John's Gospel, Thomas is one of the bravest and most decisive of the disciples. Earlier in the same Gospel, when his friend Lazarus dies, the disciples try and talk Jesus out of going back to Bethany. Because the last time they'd been there, they'd been run out of town and threatened with death. So understandably, the disciples believe that returning to Bethany will be the death of them all. But while the others plead to not go, Thomas says, let us go with Jesus, so that we may die with him if need be. Me, that's not the words of a doubter. Me, those sound like the words of someone truly willing to follow Jesus, not just on a road to glory, but even if it means they ha he has to suffer and give a personal sacrifice. The kind of follower Jesus asks us all to be. Why don't we remember Thomas for that? Even after he sees the risen Lord, Thomas gives the most exalted declaration of Jesus in the whole gospel. My Lord and my God, he says. No one before Thomas had even dared to call Jesus that, my God. And according to tradition, Thomas then set sail for India, where to this day Indian Christians still venerate Thomas as the one who brought the gospel to them. And despite all of that, we know him as Doubting Thomas. Maybe because it's the moment of doubt, that time when he wasn't sure, when he didn't know if he believed, that's the moment that we can most empathize with. While we might admire Thomas's bold determination to die with Jesus, it's actually his questioning and his desire to experience what everyone else seemed to be experiencing, but he wasn't, that we can most relate to. When it comes to faith, have you ever had any doubts? You're all looking at your down on the floor. So I'm not pointing anyone out here. Have you ever had doubts about the church? Maybe doubts about God? Is there a God? And if there is, does he hear me? And if he does hear me, does he care? Have you ever listened to stories about people in the Bible or, or listened to another devout Christian talk about their experience of faith and prayer, and you wondered, why can't I have that kind of faith? What is it I'm not getting that everyone else seems to be? Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, well, I think Thomas would understand. See, Thomas isn't the doubting disciple. He's every disciple. And that's okay, because that's what it means to walk in faith, one step at a time. If the path was laid out for us and we, there were no obstacles, no questions, no detours, and we could see straight to the end, to heaven's glory, what would we need faith for? The opposite of faith is not doubt. I think faith is walking a steady middle path between two opposite extremes. On one hand, you have self-righteousness, and on the other hand, you have complete apathy. Self-righteousness doesn't need faith because it knows everything. It knows the right answer. And if it doesn't know, it's probably wrong and not worth knowing. And on the other side, you have apathy. I don't even care to know. And faith is where we're called humbly to walk in between the two. There's some things I know, and there's some things I don't. There's some things I'd like to understand better, and there's things that I struggle with. That's faith. What has always intrigued me about Thomas is not his doubt, but his honesty not only to name his doubts, but also to say, this is what I need to believe. Although John records Jesus as saying, blessed are those who believe without seeing, I don't think that's meant as a test. I don't think Jesus is saying, those who believe without seeing are even more blessed. 
I think what he's saying is, I know that there will be people coming after us, people who will be far removed from a firsthand experience, and they're going to need to work harder at believing what they have not seen with their own eyes. They too are blessed. The fact is, no one in the Easter story believes in the risen Jesus without first seeing him. I have seen the Lord, Mary Magdalene said last Sunday at Easter. And John says today, the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So why is Thomas at fault for just wanting what everybody else has? I want to see him too. The good news of Easter is that the risen Lord doesn't wait for us to come to him in unquestioning faith. He doesn't reward us with his presence when we've proven just how strong our faith is. The risen Lord comes in all our fears and all our doubts, walking through locked doors that we hide behind if he has to in order to reach us. Because Christ doesn't come to us because we're full of faith. He comes to us because he is faithful. So what does this disciple struggling with doubt teach us about faith? Two things, I think. First, Thomas teaches us we have to be honest. That's where we have to start. Faith isn't about saying things you don't believe or pretending to accept the words of others when you simply can't. Be honest about your doubts and let it be known. Let it be known especially to God. God can handle your doubts. Thomas may have doubted, but you'll notice he didn't just walk away from the faith community even with his doubts, even when he was on a different page than everybody else. He didn't just leave. He stayed with them saying, well, help me. Help me see what you've seen. And because he did, ultimately, he did see Jesus. So Thomas tells us to start with our honesty. Be honest with God. Be honest with each other. Second thing Thomas teaches us is not to be afraid to touch the wounds. If our faith is in a God who heals and who forgives and who stands with us in our suffering, who loves even the most fallen, then where better to see such a God at work than where there is brokenness and oppression and despair? Someone once told me the reason so many Christians lose faith is because the only place they look for God is in well-decorated churches where the brass is always polished, the worship is nicely ordered, and all the people are clean and well-behaved. I'm not so sure about the well-behaved part, but... I take her point. For Thomas, the wounds in Jesus' hands and side prove that he's the one who had died on the cross, someone who knew suffering and pain. And I think people today are in the same boat. They're only going to trust a church, a faith, that knows about suffering and isn't afraid of it. So we take our faith into those torn and broken and hurting places of our lives. Can we let God touch our wounds and those of each other? I think too often we come to church and we think this is the one place and the one time a week when I have to put on a brave face and dress nicely and look like I've got it all together. Because if I don't, I'll be judged. And that always makes me sad because this is the, the very place where you should never have to worry about being judged for who you are or what you're going through. To be honest, and let your faith touch the wounds and places of your lives. And finally, Thomas makes it personal. My Lord and my God, he says. Not just Jesus is the Lord or our Lord, he's mine. We gather as a community every week and we say creeds and we pray communal prayers and we talk about what we believe. But ultimately, each of us leaves this place and it has to be personal. It has to be about what I believe and what God is doing in my life. And that faith begins when we have the honesty to struggle with it. It grows when we have the vulnerability to let it touch our most de delicate and hurting places. And it deepens when we have the desire to make it personal, to make it our own and begin a, a journey that will take our whole lives. Faith is a personal journey, but it isn't a solitary one. None of us can walk the way of faith by ourselves. It's why we need each other. It's why at moments of, of grief or disappointment, we come together because we need each other. And in faith, it's no different. We need to be with those who have seen the Lord, 
so that when we can't see him, someone else can say, I can point him to you. I can show you where he is. Like Thomas, we will all have our doubts at times. We'll be tempted, just like all the disciples were, to see this whole following Jesus thing as pointless, not making any difference, and just wanting to leave. But my prayer is that when we do experience doubt and the temptation to leave, we will have Thomas's courage to be honest about our struggles and to turn back to, not away from, our fellow disciples. I pray that we will always be a church that's intentional about making space for people's questions and compassionate towards those who are struggling because we all have struggles. I pray that St. John's is a place where one another's wounds are not things to hide or be ashamed of, but places where we see the risen Christ at work, saying to the deniers, the doubters, the strugglers, and those who fully expected to see him, peace be with you. Amen.